We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all, all united. united. Okay, so thank you very much, IGF. Um, and uh, now we can start. Um, so um, we are the United Nations Recognized Dynamic Coalition on Data-Driven Health Technologies. And a very, very warm welcome to everyone who's joined us today. Um, and the main part of this session, part one, um, will deal with our authors who have written our first book of the Dynamic Coalition, um, and it is called Health Matters, Technologies Driving Change in Healthcare, a Community of Thought. And it is a diverse um, a set of articles. Um, they grow into great depth, um, share a lot of knowledge and insight um, into their various aspects that they're dealing with. And I have the greatest pleasure to invite uh, some of the authors uh, who are with us to share an introduction to each one of those chapters. So without further ado, I'm going to invite um, Alex Buckham to please share with us um, his insights, please. Alex, the floor is yours. Alex is joining us, I think, from Poland directly. I am indeed, yes. Um, good afternoon, Amali, and uh, good afternoon, everyone else. Thank you for having me today. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, my paper addressed some of the issues relating to the impact surveillance has on mental health and well-being, with a particular focus on contemporary mass digital surveillance programs, um, state surveillance programs, that is. The continued use of mass surveillance programs that collect and store all of the data that we generate whilst using our phones, laptops, and so on, is usually justified on the grounds that they are a great help to protecting states' national security, yet they have been repeatedly shown to be unlawful and completely ineffective when it comes to preventing terror attacks. And the chances of these attacks actually happening, especially in the West, are, are routinely and grossly exaggerated. There's documented evidence for this. So these programs repeatedly found to be ineffective and unlawful, which eerily resemble English philosopher Jeremy Bentham's now infamous panopticon model for social control, have huge impacts on our collective right to privacy and subsequently our mental health and well-being also. Privacy is described by one Edward Snowden as the foundation of all other rights, and as Carissa Valise of Oxford University says, the key that unlocks the aspects of yourself that are most intimate and personal and that make you most you and most vulnerable. The worst thing you've ever done, said and thought, your inadequacies, your mistakes, your traumas. Privacy is absolutely central to the human experience. And in the words of Marie Helen Morass, when intimate details of an individual's private life are collected, stored, and disclosed to others without their consent, it's damaging to the individual. The disclosure of this information may trigger emotions like anxiety, fear, and humiliation. My article included information from various reports that found, for example, that normal law-abiding Americans' fear of prosecution led them to stop searching for words like Al-Qaeda, Hezbollah, dirty bomb, chemical weapon, and jihad, after learning of the Snowden revelations. Other findings demonstrated that American journalists self-censored for the exact same reason. Surveillance has been demonstrated to negatively impact levels of anxiety and fatigue, and similar findings from Marsden and Nesbitt showed what they call continuous monitoring negatively impacts stress, anxiety, and degrees of trust. Importantly, Gelman and Adler Bell reveal the literature on surveillance severely neglects the impact programs of this nature have on communities of non-white, non-male and non-rich people in what are characterized as high crime or unfamiliar neighborhoods. They argue that black males as a, res as a result of hyper surveillance and discrimination suffer social, physical and mental health challenges. 
Ever improving surveillance technologies, such as those constituting the US's total information awareness program, are only purported to objectively assess crime trends, thereby aiding the work of law enforcement. However, historically, crime in the US and across the world has been characterized in, in no small part in racist, sexist, and classist terms. And so ushering in new surveillance technology without dealing with these fundamentally discriminatory societal problems will only serve to perpetuate and exacerbate pre-existing issues. The historical record of states working to subvert democratic movements and peaceful civil society initiatives and target minority demographics, both at home and abroad, is worryingly rich in the, UK, the US, the UK, and abroad and further afield, excuse me. Traditionally, those who become targets are those whose values actively contradict those of powerful dominant actors within a particular state. This explains the last section of my article, which discusses how the FBI, as part of the COINTELPRO program, placed Martin Luther King under intense surveillance, sent him and his wife a surveillance tape, allegedly demonstrating his King's indiscretions and a note urging him to commit suicide. The point of this is that the episode caused King to suffer a, quote, real emotional crisis. Targeted surveillance is essential in every society to keep the population safe from dangerous criminals. However, mass surveillance does not achieve this and has proven harmful to many peaceful, law-abiding people in a variety of contexts, including causing significant harm to their mental health and well-being. Thank you for listening. Okay. Next speaker is Frederick Cohen, please. Frederick, you have the floor. Hello everyone. Hello Amali. Thank you for this invitation. I will talk uh, to you about uh, our articles uh, for uh, my article for our book uh, Health Matters, and I will give you a summary, uh, our discussion, and uh, was on the biotechnologies. And uh, uh, my article was entitled "Robotization to Renew Our Economy in a Post-Pandemic Period." and biotechnologies to support humanity. We've said that the partnership with ITU offers different possibilities to develop a cloud which can be inclusive and timely relevant. It invites stakeholders to take new responsibilities in order to benefit to the whole community. The international cooperation is enhanced and the future of our work is to share some ideas for industry world trade and public policy making. The Silk Road Initiative from the member state of China is an opportunity to the world to achieve the sustainable development goals. We increase security by our talk on emergency issues, which concerns both of the global network and the local level. In this period of pandemic, people of the world have found new solutions to protect the environment and to improve the air quality. It is the case of the Project C for RES, which offers a database of the statistical components of the atmosphere, incorporating data from universal crowdsourcing. It has become an emergency issue to provide an efficient regulation of energy from different sources. In in particular, water pipe work and road traffic, which have to work with synergy to enable transport and communication for people with disabilities, as well as to achieve a new step of development. The announced to the community of the Chinese initiative for a space solar power plant has also a great interest as it would provide wireless energy for everyone. The scientific exchanges have also inspired another technology to the last French satellite, Syracuse, which includes a system of defense against nuclear weapons in radiation. Algorithms of signal modulation permit a lot of combination from their digitalization and further progress still have to be explored. Automation in these processes would propose to implement tools that would facilitate the analysis of a data flow, and the World Bank should support this transformation in the way the population is sharing services by offering grants to NGOs as to SMEs. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you very much, uh, 
I'm a little frazzled here, but thank you very much, uh, Frederick. And just want to state again that all these articles are found um, on the Dynamic Coalition webpage, uh, which is found under Dynamic Co Coalitions under the tab of Intercessional Work of IGF. And you will be able to read these articles in detail. Most of these articles are several pages and our authors um, are providing you with a summary and we please recommend you read them because they are fantastic. So I'm going to move on to, to the next uh, person and that will be Jorn Good. Uh, please Jorn, the floor is yours. Thank you, Amalia. Uh, I'm um, not sure if I can share a slide. Um, if so, I, I would just project uh, one slide, but uh, so far I don't have the rights to do so. Um, I, I would just proceed. Uh, okay, so I just proceed. Um, <clears throat> my, my topic is, is the inherent limits of AI, uh, meaning deep learning in healthcare. And uh, we, we hear a lot of fuss about AI and, um, um, and I see at the same time, there is a, a still a big lack of understanding what AI actually is. Um, when we hear about AI being programmed, um, deep learning is not programmed. Deep learning is trained. And so there's nobody making the rules. There's nobody defining the rules, uh, but it's just trained by examples, by data. Um, and um, that training will always create stereotypes. So um, um, even if you have the best possible selected data, you will end up with stereotypes. And stereotype means bias. So this is always the result of uh, training deep learning. And uh, also there is a, a much bigger issue that is of, often overlooked. Um, this training will create training artifacts. Artifacts means that uh, in a seamless trivial situation, the system will fail. And this is something that is, um, okay, I see I now get the, the, the rights to, to share the screen. Um, um, so you have to, uh, training artifacts um, that will um, result in a system failure or uh, wrong results in a seamless trivial situation. We see that when, when a Tesla hits a truck that is uh, standing in, on the road because it is somehow different than and, uh, it was expected to be. And those artifacts are always there and they will either be found automatically and be exploited or they will uh, just uh, have the system um, give wrong results in certain situations. And this is of course very um, problematic in, in healthcare. Um, and um, we are talking about systems are black uh, boxes and um, they are black boxes. And even if you open up the black boxes and look what is happening there, the logic inside is so weird that it doesn't make any sense. So reasonable transparency is not possible. What are the consequences of understanding AI, uh, meaning deep learning that is working, uh, that uh, AI is working that way? So the best training data will still produce stereotypes and bias. So don't focus too much on training data. It will, you will have bias anyway. And even the, the determination of um, <clears throat> bias is uh, underlying the same issues as in the bias itself. So depending on the, the test data, you will discover any bias you want to have. So there will always be bias and you can't fix it. And you will have Always expect, uh, always unexpected failures of the system. This is not uh, avoidable. So, using these systems can give good results, but you have to be aware that these results, these systems are not working with a normal logic, but they are using kind of uh, some associative uh, way to um, uh, come to a decision. It's like a guts feeling. So. Um, you need to expect those systems to be what they are. And um, you, 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 uh, if you can't deal with it, don't use it or use them, uh, these systems in a way that you can handle this, these kind of problems. For example, to give you an example, uh, when you have uh, automatically uh, detection of cancer on X-ray images, 
doing it purely through this kind of system would be very problematic. But if you have first a human who does a diagnosis and then this kind of system that will signal that uh, this uh, system might disagree with the human and then another human will review the first human's decision and you could avoid the problematic aspects of uh, deep learning and at the same time use it for good. So you have to be aware and uh, when you look at the current legislation that is coming up, at least in part, the EU legislation on an AI, the EU AI Act that is currently being discussed, is approaching this in this direction. So you need to have the right safeguards when you use AI and you can't fix the system, uh, uh, these kind of problems that are inherent to deep learning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amalia, for organizing it. And um, um, yeah, so, so we can have the next speaker. Thank you. Amalia, we can't hear you. Thank you. Um, very important area, Jan, and it follows through uh, with what uh, Alex was talking to us about. And we will go back to Alex at the end uh, of the speaker queue, um, just so that uh, we want to make sure that he is recorded in there here as well. Uh, we're not sure what editing will be done um, for the um, online uh, record there. So uh, Alex, we'll go back to you at the end. Um, thank you. Now we're going to go on with uh, Dahlia, please. Uh, Dr. Dahlia Gondova, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Amadi. Um, my research in the last uh, years has been uh, concentrated also on a new technology and namely the blockchain technology. And similarly to Yon, I have been uh, looking for applications of this technology in the healthcare um, sector. And um, the research is a combination of the aspects that Alex talked about privacy and healthcare and the new technology. And the one big problem, as we are aware of in the healthcare sector, is uh, data and the privacy of the data. Now, the blockchain as a technology promises to provide a technological solution for having the patient, the user, in the driving seat. One tool would be a digital identity, a self-sovereign identity, a digital wallet in which the patient or the user of the data could actually manage their own personal data and share it with different actors in the healthcare system. And our piece of work uh, has focused on a very recent application of this technology, especially in the um, um, area of the COVID certificates. And here we have uh, looked at the IBM Digital Health Pass. Uh, the IBM Digital Health Pass provides a solution on the uh, blockchain that actually allows for sharing this personal information like a, a COVID uh, certificate um, with uh, the so-called verifiers, issuers, the different bodies within this uh, network and the user. And we have described how this um, uh, project has been structured. It is um, uh, based on the four distinct layers, um, but what what is more important is that the user at the end simply has to show the QR code as we know it uh, to the institution or the entity that needs to verify the existence of such um, certificate. And then at the background through the blockchain, actually the verifier can prove with the issuer of the certificate that this is a valid um, certificate. And um, those of you who are interested into this um, use case could read our article where we also have a, a diagram and description of the project. Thank you. But we don't hear you, Amali. Sorry. Amali. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Galia. Um, we'll move on to, to Herman, please. Um, please, Herman, you have the floor. Thank you. Oh, 
I don't know if it's possible to share to share the screen. Okay. Anyways, uh, basically, uh, the work that uh, I share is about uh, the uh, exploring the adoption of uh, Internet of Things in healthcare, because we saw with the pandemic uh, that uh, created uh, or accelerated the adoption of uh, digital technology. I told these kinds of technology that were adopted during the pandemic was more to mitigate the current problems. Uh, we see now that the, the, that is important to, 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 to look to the future. And one of the points in healthcare is about, uh, you know, facilitating and improving the, the whole uh, ecosystem. So the Internet of, the, Internet of Things will uh, basically help achieving that uh, by improving the, the, the quality of, of service. Basically, uh, Internet of Things, we have uh, different kinds of uh, definitions that also can depend of uh, situation and uh, also the, the application. Uh, but I will just use the definition of uh, Internet, of the Internet of Things uh, to a system interrelated or interconnected uh, objects that are able to collect and transfer data. Basically, uh, the main point of Internet of Things is to collect and, sh and transfer data. And when we look to the healthcare, we, look, we see that there is a possibility of you know, in, improve the health, healthcare providers uh, by using the real-time data to collect, that we can collect from hospitals uh, using uh, uh, wearable devices. Uh, and this can be applicable to home health uh, monitoring device and other main uh, uh, situation. And we see that it's important to, uh, when we talk about investing in, uh, Internet of Things, we, we, we find out that there are important issue, issues or points that we have to take into account. Uh, the, one of the first point is about digital literacy, is, not, is about literacy, because we know that uh, uh, medical doctors will have to use these kinds of system that is important for them to, you know, to have the kind of knowledge not only to use the system, but also to you know to provide any kinds of solution that's uh, to issues that can can arise from from the from the function of the the whole system. Uh, other 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 point is about uh, familiarization of Internet of Things with the patients and the uh, users, In, because we know that. Uh, uh, users must have the necessary information about the benefits of uh, Internet of Things in their life and how the Internet of Things will improve or enhance the quality of, of the care. So it's important for them to have the necessary information to, you know, to avoid also disinformation or misinformation about these kinds of technology. Um, and other point is about uh, we are, we are talking about collecting and transfer data. So it's important to you know, have or establish standards uh, that includes data protection regulation and privacy standards to ensure that uh, all products, all devices, or all platforms that we are going to use are in compliance with these kinds of standards and avoid uh, data breaches or or use of data for other purpose that is not from the from the from the from the health care. Uh, and last point will be us about cybersecurity. We know that with the increase of uh, digital technologies, uh, there is also increase uh, uh, cyber cyber attacks in the cyberspace. So it's important to to to. To, 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 I would say, embed the cybersecurity across all uh, the tools that open platforms that will be using inside the uh, Internet of Things and develop also risk reports because uh, it's important to you know, not only the, the, the team that will be involved in the implementation of the system to know about 
the possible vulnerabilities and threats and also solution. It's important also to, to, to get to know the, the patients and the users about the, uh, the, the, the necessity of, you know, of protecting this, themselves about uh, in relation to, to these kinds of attacks, I would say that. So uh, as a conclusion here, I would say that uh, basically the development of uh, innovative uh, technology uh, in combination with uh, advancement of ECTs is playing a crucial role in trans transforming the healthcare system. So in the coming years, we'll see not only the Internet of Things will play a crucial role in healthcare, but we'll see also artificial intelligence and also other uh, innovative solution that will provide uh, an easy access to, to healthcare, will also provide uh, an efficient way to, 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 to of care of service and also will provide access to a modern healthcare treatment. And this can be done uh, not only to go to the, not only by going to the hospital, but at the comfort of, uh, of, of my home or of my house without the necessity of moving around. So, Thank you, I'll just stop here. Thank you. You are more much. Thank you again. Thank you, Herman. Um, yeah, this is very interesting. Uh, we know we are going to see a lot of development when it comes to 5G and 6G and, and dealing with um, older peoples and, and how they access and that onboarding um, into the new technologies as well is, is going to be something uh, we will be very interested in. So I'm going to move on to our next speaker and that's Dr. Christine Tan. Uh, Christine, you have the floor. Hi, esteemed members uh, of our IGF Dynamic Coalition and uh, everyone uh, on site and online joining us today. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Christine Tan. Uh, I'm a national of Singapore, and today I'm representing the technical community. Um, I'm currently working uh, is uh, this China FIOT Open Lab, and we are a nonprofit platform company promoting digital technologies. Our focus area is Internet of Things, uh, IoT, as well as emerging digital technologies that go hand in hand with IoT, such as AI, uh, 5G wireless telecommunication, big data and blockchain. We have worked extensively at the leading edge of digital technologies and their end user applications, as well as help to set industry standards. In the recent years, digital healthcare has become an important area of research and development particularly in view of the aging population in some countries, as well as the global pandemic uh, COVID-19 that hit us hard in 2020. Indeed, we are still recovering from the aftermath of COVID and learning to respond, adapt, and live with new variants of the virus. In view of these global challenges, I would like to launch into my topic of discussion for today, digital technologies for new healthcare applications under the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which is also the title of my paper that you can find online. With the pandemic disrupting the lives of people worldwide, we see new social norms uh, emerging, such as prolonged periods of working or studying from home and the ubiquitous pandemiological tracking of people uh, both on a community, regional, and national level, as well as the increased need for personal chronic health management at home. Thanks to digital technologies such as IoT, smart wearable devices, QR codes, and apps, large numbers of people can now be tracked effectively across wide regional areas to contain uh, the pandemic. We see such examples of this uh, wide scale tracing in China, Singapore, uh, Australia, US. However, this also raised several social issues uh, that the earlier speakers have alluded to. 
uh, such as, for example, the elderly's steep learning curves for such new technologies, and also the accessibility of people to smartphones, wearables, and devices. Also, there are the personal data privacy and surveillance issues. So has contact tracing become a Pandora box? Uh, I'm actually pleased to note that there was a session uh, a few days ago uh, in this year's IGF uh, dedicated to the discussion of the paradox of contact tracing. Furthermore, uh, on the advances in digital technologies such as 5G, which allows for remote monitoring of patients at home by healthcare professionals who are many kilometers away. This is particularly useful for patients with chronic disease and who are unable to access local hospitals or clinics that are closed due to COVID-19. Some examples of these remote healthcare applications include uh, 5G-based peritoneal dialysis at home, monitoring of patients with cardiac conditions with alarms in the event of patient distress, and even a somewhat coarse self-screening test for COVID-19 at home. Again, we see patient data privacy as a concern here. Additionally, these new remote healthcare situations may necessitate new healthcare business models. For example, how would insurance cover dialysis at home versus the traditional dialysis centers? Another interesting use, use case is uh, sports lessons for school children at home. Uh, thanks to COVID-19 and uh, or this new social norm of people staying at home, there is now a tendency for weight gain due to the sedentary lifestyle of people. Through digital technologies, such as wearable fitness watches and camera tracking, Teachers can now set exercise regimes for children to complete at home and not just uh, language or math lessons. AI algorithms also track baseline heartbeat trends to make sure that the wearable is indeed worn by the student and not their parents or pets. Student movements are tracked by gyroscope and accelerometer sensors in the watch which are also subjected to AI algorithms uh, to determine the kinds of exercises that are being performed. So in summary, we see that digital technologies have enabled many innovative healthcare innovations in response to the COVID-19 situation. However, with these new applications, there are also new challenges like the learning curves for new technology, data privacy concerns. It is imperative that we reach out to the end users in the community to gather feedback and to understand their concerns so that we can make improvements. And we also need to consider the implications of these new social interaction modes and new economic models that are brought about by them. Overall, uh, I'm delighted that digital technologies are being used to combat the pandemic and help the world become more resilient, grow stronger as a global community, fight COVID-19 better, build back better, and collectively through international IGF consultative sessions like these, try to make sure that no one is left behind. Thank you for your kind attention and I look forward to your inputs and discussions. Thank you so much. Um, that's very much appreciated. Um, so far we have covered just a very, a very wide set of topics um, and it's been fascinating. Um, I now uh, please uh, move on to Dr. Karina Tyrell, please, uh, you have the floor. Hi, hi there. Um, it's actually not Karina here. My name is Vivian de Tushlek. Um, but I've been unable to access using a, a link. So Karina has kindly given me hers. Um, I also co-authored 
um, the article. So um, hopefully I can also speak to that article, um, which is all about um, investing in the technologies that drive change in healthcare. Um, so my name is Vivian de Tushlek. I'm actually a general partner at Rise Asset Management. We are a digital health venture capital firm. Uh, so I'm pretty well placed to see some of the trends um, and the current status of the digital health landscape, which is what I'll talk to you about today. I'll talk a bit about the investment picture and then also about the challenges that we're seeing today and how we can capture and support the rising demand for digital health solutions um, through uh, public, public and private investment. Um, so I'll start by saying that, you know, even without the acceleration of demand for digital delivery of healthcare from COVID, which I think many of us experienced over the last months um, and continue to experience, there are other, other trends, there are additional trends which have been supporting this demand growth in the digital delivery of healthcare. So those include first, our aging populations and chronic disease burden, which has led to this increase in demand. Secondly, we see we have healthcare costs rising faster than our ability to pay. And thirdly, we are seeing a declining healthcare workforce, which means we need to achieve more with fewer people. And so all these trends um, point to both an increase in demand, but also an acceleration. So how can we do more with less? Um, and of course, uh, digital delivery um, can answer some of that demand if harnessed effectively. Um, in addition to that, we're, we're looking, we can see uh, regulatory changes, changes in the regulatory environment, and also a trend in the consumerization of healthcare. And what that means is we're seeing consumers who prioritize convenience and prevention and, and choice when it comes to healthcare. And so this further supports growth in digital health solutions. And as a result, we have seen digital health solutions attracting increased investment. So um, the, uh, those areas, for example, in the first half of this year of 2021 that were most highly funded, those include research and development, R&D, on-demand healthcare, fitness and well-being, um, treatment of disease and consumer health information. So those are the, the, the value propositions. On the clinical indication side, those that have been the highest funded are mental health, cardiovascular disease, uh, diabetes, primary care and substance use disorder. And we have seen that funding as a whole uh, is increasing. So in the US, for example, again, in the first half of 2021 of this year, there was more investment capital allocated to this sector, digital health, and particularly not just healthcare, digital health, than in the whole of 2020, and it stood at $14.7 billion. So, you know, so the demand picture is growing and accelerating, the investment picture is growing, is growing. However, there are many challenges that still remain. And um, many of those include the inability to scale um, some of the early stage companies. And there are many operational challenges that mean that even if we have incredibly novel digital health solutions, sometimes these do not um, get the scale in order to be able to be effective and to actually impact, um, uh, you know, impact patients out there effectively. Um, and so what are those challenges and what are some of the ways that we can think about addressing them? So on the ability to scale, uh, there's often restricted uh, opportunity to develop and fund solutions developed by those with direct experience of patient care. So we find um, that those who have that direct experience of patient care are often best placed and understood, understand best how to develop digital health solutions. So there are some programs such as the UK's Clinical Entrepreneur Program. These programs are growing. However, it can still be really, you know, they're still nascent and it can be tricky to scale and, and for our healthcare systems to really adapt and adopt some of the solutions. Um, payment models and regulatory challenges, they can also prove fatal for very early stage businesses. 
So established and sector focused investors can support by helping founders not only navigate the regulatory landscape, but also identify distribution partners. And I can talk a little bit about that afterward uh, uh, in a minute. Um, but uh, so, so looking at this early stage funding, you know, we can't we, we can't just have the private sector be funding, you know, these digital health solutions um, because we need to help them get past these riskier early stage earlier stages and so we think strategic incentives are needed so this can come from strategic distribution partners from governmental r d tax incentives research and development tax incentives and from grant funding and not just from private institutional investment but if we combine all these then we're looking at a picture where some of these challenges of moving these uh, early stage businesses up the curve they can really be helpful Finally, I just wanted to address the operational challenges. So these include data ownership, data protection, interoperability, fragmentation, as well as training healthcare professionals to adopt new technologies. And again, these challenges can be overcome with support on global collaboration from organizations such as the United Nations and the, the World Health Organization. And so these include, for example, adoption of the global strategy on digital health 2020 to 2025. And these are where we can um, capture some of the huge opportunities to increase access and reduce costs in the digital delivery of healthcare. So by addressing these challenges, we can really properly harness those opportunities provided by digital health to increase access, reduce cost, and improve quality of care. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Vivian. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for your team for for writing the, the paper for us. Uh, that you know brings finance into this as well, which is which is excellent and and is a great driver, as we know, in, into dealing with uh, with technology. And that was highlighted actually at the ITU um, this year in terms of that need for uh, public private partnerships um, to connect the last mile, and then uh, as we would like to have quality internet to provide uh, healthcare and other, uh, you know, educational and economic services uh, to the population. So now we're at the end, almost at the end, and I just want to uh, say a few things. Uh, myself, um, I wrote a, a couple of opinion pieces, and uh, one was to highlight uh, quantum technologies, and it's going to have a significant impact um, on healthcare uh, yet to be determined fully, uh, but it definitely is going to be the case. Um, going with that um, and the use of statistics, um, you know, I, I'm very much of the opinion um, that uh, actually statistics should be developed further, you know, um, and I think we will have new innovation with that uh, coming from artificial intelligence, especially quantum technologies and so forth. Um, and I think also the emotional side of artificial intelligence is, is going to be something that we need to look at, uh, from, possibly from a healthcare uh, perspective. And um, as uh, you know, Alex talked about uh, surveillance and so forth, uh, I think the wellness of people, um, I have an article there uh, talking about Plato and, and humanity and so forth, then I wonder whether uh, human beings will get a little bit jealous of, of technology. And, and that's something that we, we need to think about. Um, you know, in, in the old days, we talk about robots taking over the world when we were children and so forth. Um, but this could be a very real thing. And I think the emotional side of, of people using and developing and being um, losing their jobs to artificial intelligence uh, is something that we really should consider. Now, given our two years of uh, work in, um, with this dynamic coalition, we, it, something that has really come to light is what I term the rites of passage of data. Uh, data is moving from one system or from one database uh, to be used uh, in, in perhaps not the original purpose that the data was collected for, as Yuan has indicated, um, and others. Um, so this sharing data use, final reporting, means that the data um, may have to go through 
what I call a sort of rites of passage. You know, how good is the quality of data when it moves from one system to the other? And all our um, authors have, have spoken about that. And, and I know there are various uh, systems in place, um, you know, um, uh, IEEE, uh, international standards, uh, you know, uh, ITU standards, um, you know, ISO standards. There are all kinds of, um, uh, so frameworks in place, but I want to to suggest from our perspective, and I will go back to an article. The writer is not present with us, but I will go back to that after I say this. Um, I think we should look at seven rights for quality data success uh, use um, in in our applications go, going forward, and especially with data sharing. And the rights I'm talking rights of passage are with looking at approach, um, which is whole whole thing, uh, whole approach, uh, intent, and so forth, inclusion. As Alex was talking about, uh, you know, including everybody in um, the design and data management protections, you know, such as privacy, uh, communications, um, and this can be communications that are people centered, that are technology centered, and the feedback. It's very important to have feedback, um, as Herman talked about risk management. It's important to have feedback so that we risk manage it. And COSO, um, which is uh, something used in business, um, a framework uh, out of uh, Australia and New Zealand, looks at this kind of feedback system. So feedback is very important. And then we need to talk about implementation and delivery. And, you know, is, is that all effective? So those are, over the past seven, uh, two years, uh, what I've seen is, uh, you know, highlighted from our dynamic coalition, uh, seven uh, sort of qualities for, for success. Now I want to go back and, uh, we had um, a, a submission of an article from um, Emma Slade, um, and she is a, a British lady um, who was in investment banking. She gave that up, and uh, she became a yoga teacher, and then she became a, a Bhutanese ordained nun. And she wrote for us a piece on ethics, medicine, and technology. And I want to read uh, some sections from this article for you. She says, I, at first I wondered how to make a helpful contribution to this debate as I pondered uh, the, the items of ethics, technology, and medicine. I wondered if there was for me as a Buddhist nun a problem in separating out the idea of ethics into a distinct separate category anyway. While the word ethics can be considered as a separate area of study, I'm tempted to see that it is more the very ground in which all other disciplines and ideas thrive. From a Buddhist point of view, when supporting the development of human being and their mind, many things are talked about as developing together in an interconnected way rather than separation. This is a living representation of the Buddhist philosophy of independence and shown below is the eight sports wheel. It is clear that overall change or movement is not possible when there are missing spokes to a wheel. And she talks about an eightfold path of the noble one. And she says it's right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. So she puts right in front. And so what she said, now what she goes on to say is, so what might this basic quality of rightness mean in the debate we have been considered, asking to be considered? So what would we say if it was said right technology or right medicine? So then she goes on to say, what about right medicine or right technology in understanding? Right technology or right medicine in thought? Right technology or right medicine in speech? Right technology or right medicine in action? Right technology or right medicine in livelihood? Right effect for technology and medicine? Right mindfulness for technology and medicine? And right concentration for medicine and technology. I'm just quoting to that at the end. She goes, in cultivating such ethics, we can expect it three pillars to be brought out from Buddhist perspective. And it says to refrain from harm, to practice doing good, and to train one's own mind. So I'm scrolling right to the bottom of her article. And she concludes by saying, in some ways, I have wondered if enabling support of technology is in fact the panacea to achieving a wonderfully ethical world driven by the wish to relieve suffering. My understanding is that algorithms which are increasingly driving well-being apps are raising this possibility. If someone shows a propensity to study right mindfulness, 
the algorithms will ensure they are offered more and more mindfulness support. Even more game-changing would be the core principle of non-harming incorporate into the framework of algorithms. When we look at the world, we witness again and again an ease with which causing harm to others, to animals, and to nature. Whilst more transparent interconnections have highlighted this in so many ways, environmental supply chains and plastic use, how much further could it go supported by technology? So beautiful piece. Um, please, I encourage you to, again to go to our online book and uh, read these articles in, in detail, um, which would be really very, very beneficial, I think, for anybody working in this space. Now, I do want to go back to Alex. Alex, would you be willing to um, perhaps share your piece again? Because I don't want it to be missed out if they don't do um, an editing. Yeah, no problem. No problem okay. at all. Um, yeah, basically, my paper addressed some of the issues related to the impact that surveillance has on mental health and well-being, um, with a particular focus on contemporary mass digital state surveillance programs. Um, the continued use of mass surveillance that collects and stores all of the data that we generate whilst using phones, laptops, and so on, is usually justified on the ground that they're a great help to protecting states' national securities. Yet they've been repeatedly shown to be completely ineffective and unlawful when it comes to, sorry, completely unlawful and completely ineffective when it comes to preventing terror attacks. Um, and the chances of these attacks actually occurring, especially in the West, uh, is routinely and grossly exaggerated. These programs repeatedly found to be ineffective and unlawful which eerily resemble English philosopher Jeremy Bentham's now infamous panopticon model for social control, um, have huge impact on our collective right to privacy and subsequently on our mental health and well-being. Privacy is described by one Edward Snowden as the fountainhead of all other rights and Carissa Valiz of Oxford University as the key that unlocks the aspects of yourself that are most intimate and personal that make you most you and most vulnerable. The thing, the worst thing you've ever done, said and thought, your inadequacies, your mistakes, your traumas. Privacy is absolutely central to the human experience. And in the words of Marie Helen Morass, when intimate details of an individual's private life are collected, stored and disclosed to others without their consent, it's damaging to the individual. The disclosure of this information may trigger emotions like anxiety, fear and humiliation. So my article included information from various reports that found, for example, that normal law-abiding Americans' fear of prosecution led them to stop searching for words like Al-Qaeda, Hezbollah, dirty bomb, chemical weapon, and jihad after learning of the Snowden revelations. Other findings demonstrated that American journalists self-censored for the exact same reason. Surveillance has been demonstrated to negatively impact levels of anxiety and fatigue. Similar findings from Marsden and Nesbitt showed what they call continuous monitoring negatively impacts stress, anxiety, and degrees of trust. Importantly, Gelman and Adler Bell reveal the literature on surveillance severely neglects the impact that programs of this nature have on communities of non-white, non-male, and non-rich people, in which are in what are characterized as high crime and unfamiliar neighborhoods. They argue that black males, as a result of hyper surveillance and discrimination, suffer social, physical, and mental health challenges. Ever improving surveillance technology, such as those constituting the US's Total Information Awareness Program, are only purported to objectively assess crime trends, thereby aiding the work of law enforcement. However, historically, crime in the US and across the world has been characterized in no small part in racist, sexist, and classist terms. And so ushering in new surveillance technology without dealing with these fundamentally discriminatory societal problems will inevitably only serve to perpetuate and exacerbate pre-existing issues. The historical record of states working to subvert democratic movements and peaceful civil society initiatives and target minority demographics, both at home and abroad, is worryingly rich in the US, the UK and elsewhere. Traditionally, 
Those who become targets are those whose values actively contradict those of powerful dominant actors within a particular state. This, this uh, explains the last section of my article, which discusses how the FBI, as part of the COINTELPRO program, placed Martin Luther King under intense surveillance, sent him and his wife a surveillance tape, allegedly demonstrating King's indiscretions and a note urging him to commit suicide. Now, why would I mention this? Because the episode caused King to suffer a, quote, real emotional crisis. Targeted surveillance is essential in every society to keep the population safe and from dangerous criminals. However, mass surveillance does not achieve this and has proven harmful to many peaceful, law-abiding people in a variety of contexts, including causing significant harm to their mental health and well-being. Thank you. Back to you, Amali. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, and uh, yes, so uh, apologies to everyone on, on what happened right at the beginning. Um, so now we will move um, to um, an open discussion. Um, and before we start that, um, we, we want to share with everyone that we are having a, a, what we're calling a symposium at the, at, the, at the moment, but it'll be, I guess, some workshops um, in the new year. And um, Herman, would you like to share uh, something on, on yours? Um, okay, so we are we are going to have a focus on uh, youth and uh, and which is great. Um, at on day zero, for instance, um, at IGF Poland, um, there was a special interest in youth, and we are hoping that we can support that as well. Um, and Helman will take the the lead on that one, uh, being a former IGF youth ambassador. Um, and uh, we also hope to to deal with um, indigenous help. Um, and tie that into um, the environment as well. So those are our plans um, going into the new year, but we want to open it, uh, this discussion to anyone to share um, their viewpoints, uh, uh, share with us what they think the Diamond Dynamic Coalition should, uh, should work on uh, for 2022, 23, and so forth. Um, and to start that off, I want to give the floor to uh, Dr. Uh, Amando Espinoza, who is part of our Dynamic coalition. Uh, please, uh, Amado, can you please start this section for us? That would be appreciated. Yes, um, thanks, uh, Amali. Uh, and thank you, very, every, thank you very much for everybody for your encouraging participations. I think it has been a very good job that you have already summarized into this very, very short participations. And, and as uh, Amali told us, uh, we we are in Latin America really keen in in order to learn uh, about the uh, best practices and experiences of the applications of new technologies into the uh, healthcare sector. Uh, I am a physician myself uh, with a, um, a specific area of practice in the field of clinical informatics, and I. I am uh, supporting uh, some initiatives in Mexico, which are uh, at this point related to the implementation of the personal health record, the electronic medical record, uh, how to standardize, how to uh, provide the proper um, regulations framework, which is necessary in order to take advantage of um, the the technology as well, and and certainly for the sake of the um, uh, the the growth of this DC, uh, I, it is it is important to allow people, specifically from this sector in Mexico, who really does not do, do not have a a clear idea what does. Uh, internet internet governance means and how can we really equip in terms of uh, data governance and data sharing, data security, uh, and uh, all these uh, requirements that we that we do have in order to to uh, be able to appropriate uh, new technologies in in the same. Uh, in the same dimension or in the same speed that they are showing up or coming up into the market. And uh, of course, we we want to uh, organize a, a workshop in 
uh, there in Mexico together with with all all of you uh, we we will be very interested in having this uh, different uh, uh, participations and the different perspectives that you already have sh uh, shared with us and we uh, i think for the first, very first time we can we can offer or we can we can introduce the general um, proposal in terms of what uh, is already happening uh, but uh, th these kind of discussions that, like uh, or, or remarks that uh, we are having here at the chat, I think they are also very important because it's the at, at the end of the day is the uh, output of the of many many sessions, many hours of reflecting about well what is what is really behind this black box of AI and how those really this. Uh, neural networks work and how do they do, do they are trained and how blockchain uh, really can provide a, an advantage in terms of uh, how to uh, encode the the or control the the security of the information of the, at the for for the health data and how can we uh, further help uh, patients and physicians to safely exchange in a uh, remote environment in a telemonitoring um, environment the, the 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 data that is necessary to come up with a proper diagnosis and treatment and then uh, all the, all what we what, what you have already equipped uh, or, or put together in this first publication I really congratulate you and recognize uh, the the amount of work that is inside and certainly we we want to join the group and also of course through uh, the leadership of Amali to to getting uh, connected with the work that the uh, who and ITU are uh, already uh, developing in the uh, in this uh, working group of uh, uh, for healthcare and or AI for for healthcare and, and of course uh, we we will be uh, very grateful to to receive all this feedback and to learn how to also be part of the uh, new uh, digitalization of the healthcare services in our region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and, and yes, just to highlight, we, we do actually work closely uh, with ITU. Um, there are writers here uh, for the book uh, who are from the, the IT, also part of the ITU conversations as well. And uh, this year as well, um, we were honored to, to be able to participate uh, on the high level uh, panel at the WISIS forum uh, from, from this easy. Um, so so we, we try to actively work with them and we have also started working with the WHO as well through their partnership um, with the ITU. So uh, so please welcome to, to everyone who, who may be joining us who are not part of our dynamic coalition, please join us. And, and we really wish to uh, discuss uh, new frontiers um, in this emerging area. We think uh, obviously we have heard about the investment and there's going to be ongoing investment um, increasingly so I believe uh, from the public health side as well. Um, so please be with us because, you know, I think uh, for anything, if we have a good foundation, um, we can expect great things. But if the foundation is not strong, um, then obviously whole, the building can collapse. So um, what we do here and at the Internet uh, Governance Forum is really to look at very good foundations and, and ethics. Uh, that's, uh, you know, a core policy area um, that they ask us uh, to, to discuss. So given all that, we'd love to have our audience share with us um, their views. Um, and um, Amada, how many, do you have any other people in the room with you? Yes, we have two participants and uh, yes, one, one of them is willing to, to take the floor, if okay. you allow so it. Okay, so we're going to give two minutes to uh, to each participant. Uh, please, uh, you have the floor um, from Poland. Um, anyone else, please, can you uh, put your hands up um, on when you're online so that we can identify you as well, please. Please, you have the floor in Poland. If 
you are so kind to identify yourself and, and introduce yourself, I'm sorry. And Hello, everybody. My name is Jacques Beckelinger. I'm co-secretary of the Swiss IGF. And I just wanted to briefly share with you the, the outcome of a very interesting discussion we had on the, this year's um, national IGF on particularly whether uh, digitalization has helped enough to combat uh, the combat uh, the COVID crisis. And quite an interesting thing in, in particular, the, and then the discussion turned around uh, whether it is okay to have due to data protection regulations, the authorities turning, so to say, in a, on a blind spot. So they, they have, we heard uh, one uh, public official uh, in charge of, uh, of uh, the, the, the pandemic measures for, uh, for a region just complaining that he has to take decisions on virtually no information because the health sector was so probably uh, rightly so in general was so uh, closed with uh, personal information since health is personal information and just uh, therefore she was quite unable to take a recent um, uh, sensible decision and uh, just to cut a long story short in the end in the messages we we uh, um, uh, Note it down that it's really a, um, a conflict of interest, and there are there is not just data protection, as important it is, but uh, it's just a, a competing uh, a competition amongst the fundamental rights, which need careful assessment by the regulators. Thank you very much for that insight. Um, that, that's very good to know. Um, and um, we are, yeah, we are also very concerned about the, the privacy. And then on the other side, the, the data sharing and the uh, anonymous sharing um, and so forth. And it, it has been uh, something that this dynamic coalition um, has been very interested actually in the past two years. And uh, we would very much encourage you to join us uh, in this conversation so that uh, perhaps we can have that conversation in, in 2022 in, in, in depth. Uh, thank you very much for that contribution. Very much appreciated. Um, is there anyone else, Amado? Um, uh, I, 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 if I may um, make a comment sure, uh, sure. shortly. Um, yes, I, I totally agree uh, that the healthcare sector uh, has been always very uh, respectful of the of the personal data because also all the legal processes behind are so strong, mainly in uh, West countries or West economic countries. Uh, and uh, I, I think uh, no matter that, uh, the, for example, the, these tracking uh, COVID cases apps from, from the uh, large companies uh, couldn't make it. Or, for example, the, the German government who invested a lot of money in its app, and they, they couldn't make it to, to get used into the population. Uh, I think it's a two sides uh, of the problem. It, it's, it's not only the, the authorities and the institutions from healthcare, but also patients are a little bit afraid that uh, when their data is shared, they can have uh, some kind of uh, professional or social or uh, other kind of problems, or in, uh, including legal problems. For example, in the US, the uh, population who, the, the, who, who is not properly documented, uh, they, they are afraid that uh, through this kind of uh, uh, data repositories can, can get in, into, trouble, into problems. Then uh, I... I'm certainly sure that this kind of forums like the IGF will provide to policy decision makers and also the, uh, um, the, the people responsible for the uh, data sharing in the healthcare sector a, a huge amount of trust and confidence in order to look forward how the who the World Health Organization or some other international organization can provide this, this framework for these 
global repository of data sharing, which would lead us to population health models and global health models and stuff like that. But uh, certainly we we are uh, dealing with. Uh, yes, please go ahead. Just a very short, uh, short reply to that. So one uh, aspect also that we discovered in the other discussions was that just due to the fact that data protection is so strong, the the infrastructure for exchanging health data was just in a way voluntarily neglected. And now in case of pandemic, it was just impossible to set up the infrastructure needed even though, so in a technical sense, even though the political will would have been there to, uh, to be a little bit uh, more progressive in uh, interpreting uh, data protection. It's just the, the, the fact that, uh, that the data protection is so strong just led also to technical deficiencies. Yes, thank you very much for this remark. Yes, Amalie. Yes, thank you. Is there anybody else there? Thank you. Those remarks are very much appreciated. Yes. Um, uh, is there anyone else in Poland who, there who would like to speak, Amadi? Not, not here in Katowice. OK, thank you. Oh, um, I would reply to this um, question concerning data protection. OK, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so we, we have seen uh, a lot of uh, issues around uh, data protection and uh, the tracking app, which is very privacy friendly, uh, is, is, um, has, has still been um, um, met with, uh, with uh, a lot of skepticism. And uh, when you see, for example, um, is there a the possibility of a vaccination register? Um, data protection authorities in many European countries say there they, they shouldn't be. Uh, on the other hand, uh, for example, in Denmark, there is a, a national vaccination register since uh, 2015. So it is possible with GDPR to do that. But um, GDPR um, is uh, creating high administrative burdens. And even with the COVID pass right now, uh, employers in Germany are being told that they are not allowed to store COVID passes of their employees, but that they have to check them every day again and again and again. And this, this doesn't make any sense, but uh, you see this, this approach that um, data protection uh, is uh, creating a lot of anxiousness and a lot of um, um, difficult, sometimes even stupid procedures are done because uh, somebody is afraid of data protection and issues. And uh, actually, um, data protection uh, often requires to have a, sp a specific law to allow for data processing, which is difficult in a kind of co in times of COVID, where uh, the time to discuss and draft and uh, pass laws is not always there, or the situation already changes uh, when the uh, when the law has been passed, and this uh, renders things uh, a bit difficult. But the main issues be, uh, behind data sharing, I guess, is not data protection, but bureaucracy. But um, often bureaucracy and data protection and, uh, are not always be uh, indistinguishable. Uh, sorry, are not always distinguishable. So uh, data protection leads to a lot of bureaucracy, which actually then prevents uh, the right sharing of data. Thank you, Jan. Yes, exactly. And um, I know Frederick has been, uh, Frederick Cohen on our Dynamic Coalition um, has, has been uh, highlighted very much for us, uh, the need for collaboration. And uh, I think it would be interesting, just thinking on my feet here, for us to identify um, the various groups that should be collaborating um, when it comes to uh, data and medical data, obviously, in our case, and public health data. Um, and I know uh, last year, because of COVID, uh, it was highlighted uh, because, for instance, people want to know how can they travel, um, you know, how can we have, uh, you know, vaccine passports or, um, and then I think, uh, you know, they, they mentioned, for instance, for Singapore, um, having some um, yellow fever uh, uh, sort of uh, passporting system. Um, I'm not sure if uh, Chris, uh, Dr. Christine is is with us still to highlight that, um, but I, I know they mentioned uh, Singapore in, in one instance as well. And it's something I'm finding that, you know, 
two years on the whole whole business of international travel, for instance, and you know coming even to Poland, um, you know is is not easy. Um, you know all of a sudden there are changes uh, to the quarantine requirements, or or you know one country doesn't. Uh, 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 recognize a certain form of vaccine. Um, and um, I, I know, um, I think uh, Mr. Subramaniam was with us. I saw his name, but um, during our session, our prep session on, on Sendai, he, he brought up, um, oh, uh, uh, Siva, would you like to talk about some indigenous? Um, uh, Amali, I, I'm afraid we are uh, running out of time and another session is gonna take place here. Okay, okay. So anyway, just, just to conclude, um, he, he spoke about, you know, the use of um, uh, indigenous uh, medicines, for instance, and that was something why it uh, prompted us to, to move into that discussion for next year, um, in terms of, you know, what happens in terms of preventative medicine, um, and, and, and so forth, um, in, in this era of, of COVID and on an Omicron. So anyway, thank you. To, to wrap up, uh, this has been a fascinating um, uh, session. Um, so sorry for the beginning, uh, that was not under our control. Um, and I please encourage uh, everyone to, to read our book, uh, our set of articles um, online um, at uh, the IGF website under the Dynamic College for Data Driven Technologies. Thank you very much for joining us. And, and thank you, I clap to all our authors. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>